Hello. Today we're going to be discussing chapter 14, Odds and Ends, in the uh, book Loosening uh, the Grip, uh, which will be the last lecture in this book. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, move right along. Chapter 14, Loosening the Grip. Uh, clinicians frequently discover that uh, through their formal job description is centered on serving clients, their often expectations, uh, and I don't know why this bouncing, their often expectations uh, that, uh, are, and other issues to consider other than provision of direct services. And these duties fall into the general area of indirect services, or things that we do that are ancillary to our primary duties. Uh, it's a bit of an awkward phrase used to cover all the things, um, other things that clinicians are often required to do. And um, I guess this is a good time to break the news to you that that's true with people who are uh, substance abuse counselors too. Uh, other than working with our clients, we're often called upon to do a variety of other things, educational activities among them. If you're working at uh, an agency, uh, there's a, a very good possibility that at some point in time you'll be called upon to participate in town hall meetings or uh, educational presentations. Oh, excuse me, I don't know where that came from. Uh, uh, for other professionals or for students or for people in the community, etc. Uh, and uh, it's uh, something that you can expect at some point in your career. If you are called upon uh, to uh, provide an educational service, there are some do's and don'ts that the book recommends for you. One is not to wing it, but to prepare yourself uh, for an effective presentation. And one of the things that I uh, tell people uh, for the presentation assignments is uh, there's a three-step um, uh, process that you do when you're going to do a presentation for a group of people. First, you tell them what you're going to, to tell them. Then you tell them, which is the second step, and the third step is to tell them what you told them. So you introduce what you're going to do, you do it, and then you wrap it up, you summarize. Uh, if, uh, anytime you're going to do something like this, you have some considerations, and they're important considerations. Who are you going to be talking to? How much time do you have? What information is important to present to this group of people in the amount of time that you have? Uh, what kind of questions are likely to be on the audience's mind? What do they need to know? What do you think they would like to know? Uh, and then uh, prepare it and cover that. You've probably heard this in your uh, <laughs> in your speech classes at some point, and if you haven't, you will. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can also do things like, I have a lot of presentations that are already ready to go, uh, should I need them for, for someone, uh, or, um, you know, and I can update them as I need to. So you can feel free to develop s several topics and presentations. Some of my, uh, uh, former students who've done presentations here at Lee College have uh, expanded on the presentations that they've done. And there's a couple of them that have turned into curriculums. Uh, so you can take it as far as you want. Uh, doing handouts, using visual aids, uh, that sort of thing. Public speaking doesn't uh, come easy uh, for a lot of us, but uh, a great deal of what we do involves communication with people. In fact, our whole job is about communication uh, with people. Some don'ts, uh, some key don'ts really are to avoid crusading. 
Uh, and the book says we should avoid personal accounts or to use um, the, you know, the language of I, I don't uh, engage in a lot of drunk logs or horror stories. Uh, and that's pretty good advice. Uh, the uh, truth of the matter is that if you were to go to an AA meeting, you'd probably hear a lot of self-disclosure. And what that means is uh, there are people there who are ex sharing with one another, uh, hopefully, their experience, strength, and hope with one another. And that's fine. That's the way that program works. Uh, but uh, if we engage in a lot of personal disclosure at the public level with, uh, with our audiences, chances are pretty good that won't work out as well for us. Uh, again, you have to consider your, off, uh, your uh, um, audience and who they are and at what level you can talk to them, what level of language you need to use, etc. Uh, and uh, hammering at them uh, usually turns the audience off. Preaching is preaching, however you uh, disguise it. And I'm not hammering on any uh, on any preachers, I'm just saying that, uh, uh, you know, if an audience feels like you're talking um, down to them or that, uh, uh, that, you're, that you're so involved with yourself that you think your story is so compelling that it's going to uh, change their lives, it's likely to be a turnoff for them. I'm not uh, as anti-self-disclosure as some in the field, and I'm definitely not as anti-self-disclosure as the people, uh, as, as the book. Uh, I believe that uh, self-disclosure is a quick way uh, to build credibility with the client and to uh, uh, make the client a little more comfortable with you in most cases. But if you're going to do any self-disclosure, the important thing to remember is that um, uh, you have to measure what you're going to share uh, by, uh, is it for the client's benefit? Uh, what, it, what is it that I'm going to share? Is it for them or is it for me? And if the answer is, it will be something that will benefit your client, then you're probably okay with doing it within uh, limitations. You may have noticed that sometimes in discussions where there's a lot of personal disclosure, it gets into kind of a, oh yeah, well let me tell you about what I did, <laughs> you know, and that's not going to get us uh, get us anywhere. Uh, so uh, limit uh, your uh, your disclosures. Another thing that you'll be uh, do it with um, uh, as a professional out there working at an agency, and this happens really, you know, whether you want it to or not, is, uh, you know, one day your boss may come by and say, uh, you know, oh, hey, Bubba, come here. <laughs> you know, this is so-and-so, and they're an intern from the University of fill in the blank or this is so-and-so who's a practicum student from Lee College. Uh, so show them the ropes and, uh, you know, get them started in their uh, uh, work here and, uh, uh, you know, supervise them. Well, supervising interns is part of a professional's job, is part of giving back to the profession. As you are finishing your classes here, you're going to be doing cooperative education, and that cooperative education is going to be where you hone the skills that you learn in uh, class and you go out there on the job and you develop your uh, proficiency with uh, these um, duties, these tasks that you're uh, required to perform. You are providing a service to the agency where you're uh, uh, doing your work, but they're also providing a service to you. And 
supervising interns and and uh, practicum students can be a great deal of work. It's tempting to think, well, you know, this is going to make my caseload lighter because I've got someone else here to do the stuff that I really don't want to work. Uh, you know, I don't want to do. I'll put them over here. Uh, uh, sorting through the files and catching up the progress notes and all that good stuff that I'd rather not do. Uh, but that's not what they're there to do. They're out there to shadow you and to uh, uh, learn how to be a, a substance abuse counselor. And that's a pretty hefty responsibility if you think about it. Uh, so you'll be experiencing this as students, but as professionals, you'll be expected to participate in this and to supervise your students and to try to supervise them well. It's especially important to stick to your area of uh, expertise, your unique skills, uh, and your, uh, a bit, your unique skill will be your ability to interact therapeutically with people who have substance use disorders. Uh, and you will have specialized knowledge in this area, and you will develop that when you're out on the job and actually doing uh, the counseling. We don't expect you to know everything. We expect you to know some of it, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, we expect you to avoid falling into traps. Uh, and one of the traps that you can give is uh, that you can fall into is acting as if there's something mysterious and strange and psychic about uh, what we do when actually it's very practical. Uh, the uh, uh, a good skill to cultivate as a student and as a counselor is if you don't know something, uh, say you don't know it. <laughs> you know, don't try to, don't try to fake it. Um, so, uh, supervision of trainees or uh, trainees or students might be helpful, uh, but uh, you know, you're going to be providing them a service while they're providing you one. So it, your workload may feel like it's increased through this process, and in fact, um, it, it could be. If you're supervising people, and know, know this too, is when you're doing your own cooperative education out on a site somewhere, is uh, make sure that the clients uh, know about the trainees and that you introduce the clients to the tra uh, the trainees to the clients as trainees. Uh, sometimes uh, people are reluctant uh, to work with students and honestly that's okay if they're reluctant to work with students. Uh, they may be reluctant to allow trainees to set in on the sessions that you have with them. If they are uh, shine that on and uh, don't take it personally. Uh, you know, clients have the right to uh, uh, to express their uncomfort and to refuse to work with uh, uh, with trainees. So you know, you can be judicious about it. I'll say, you know, here's so and so, and she's a student at Lee College, and uh, she's learning how to be a counselor. She's been through a lot of classes, had some training, and part of her training is to set in with us here and see what uh, counseling is all about. And uh, she's bound by the same rules that I am, con limits of confidentiality, etc. Do you mind if she sets in with us? Uh, and generally, people don't. And if they do, then I honor that. Um, so uh, that's one thing. Uh, and students uh, who are shadowing counselors on the job don't just observe. You have to do things too, and they have to do things. One of the uh, tasks that your super on the job supervisors uh, are responsible for is to direct you in the performance of uh, duties on the job to give you feedback, to tell you if you're doing something right or if you're doing something wrong and guide you uh, and keep you on the right path. 
uh, and uh, that's perfectly okay. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. And when you are out there as a professional and have a, a intern or a student under you, that's your responsibility too, to show them the ropes, to guide them, to let them know when they're doing something well and when they're not. So uh, those are some things that you can expect once you get through with all your training, get your practicum hours behind you, get your license, uh, welcome to the, you know, to, welcome to the real world. Uh, Another thing that's important, uh, and it's becoming a profession in its own right, is prevention. Uh, there are a number of different types of prevention, and substance abuse counselors uh, have always been involved in prevention efforts. Uh, and that's the case whether we like it or not. I mean, it's just something that we have uh, uh, wound up doing. The uh, one of the reasons that we are engaged in prevention is because we are frontline uh, service providers. We have a lot of client contact, uh, and we're in a perfect position to engage in prevention efforts. We have credibility with the people that we work with. And we have credibility in the agency in which we're employed, and we have credibility with the, uh, the community in most cases. So uh, the prevention is, uh, uh, is something that we, uh, uh, it, it is naturally a part of what we do. When you think about prevention, there are several different types of it. Uh, and the public health model, community mental health system, introduced the notion of different levels of prevention. Uh, there's primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention activities. And when you start talking to people about prevention, you start getting hit with a lot of other terminologies. And some of you uh, who have already taken uh, the Lee College prevention classes are familiar with this. Uh, there's universal uh, prevention efforts, which are uh, aimed at everybody. Uh, you know, uh, the entire seventh grade, uh, the entire company, the, uh, uh, you know, the nursing d division, whatever it is. Uh, and it's for everyone who's in there. And it's generally an educational effort, uh, this universal. Uh, indicated uh, prevention is something is there that indicates prevention efforts are needed. Uh, you have high-risk groups uh, uh, who may, may be high-risk because of parental substance use, may be high-risk because of the uh, prevalence of gang activity in, uh, in their neighborhoods. There's all kinds of high-risk groups that you can uh, consider and those are indicated. They have some of the risk factors that are there. Uh, that means they could be at risk for falling into substance abuse. Uh, so uh, again, that depends on who you're talking to. The three key types of uh, prevention uh, that are addressed by the author is uh, uh, the primary prevention. And primary prevention is efforts that are geared toward any population, whether they're high risk or low risk, but any population, uh, the, the efforts toward prevention is to prevent the illness in the first place so that someone does not fall into uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Someone does not develop a substance use disorder, uh, and that's uh, primary prevention. That's keeping it from happening in the first place. There's a quote in one of these cartoons in here from Poor Richard's Almanac back in the 1700s. Benjamin Franklin said, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and it certainly is. If you can prevent uh, people from smoking, for instance, uh, then chances are pretty good you will have prevented them from getting uh, 
uh, emphysema or lung cancer, sometimes heart disease, a lot of illnesses that later on is going to be a big problem and maybe incurable. It may be something that can't be turn, turned around. So if we can stop people from doing the behavior that gets them to that place, then we're talking about primary prevention. A second way to lower the number of sick individuals is to identify and treat those who contract the disease as quickly as possible. And that involves, you know, uh, 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 interventions early on with people who are um, uh, already involved in alcohol and drug use and who already have uh, the disease. And intervening on people who have already formed a uh, maladaptive relationship with their chemicals and restoring them to health is secondary uh, prevention. The third type is that uh, is, is very closely related to secondary prevention and this is with people who uh, uh, have used the drug, have developed a substance use disorder, have gotten into treatment, and who have established sobriety. Uh, and so basically what you're looking at uh, with tertiary uh, prevention is um, uh, relapse prevention. Stop the steps that are taken to avoid relapse and to address relapse uh, when it uh, occurs. So, uh, it can be somewhat complicated. Uh, a problem uh, with uh, substance abuse prevention is that there are a number of, uh, of uh, approaches that have been employed uh, during, uh, you know, in the past, to, which in, may have involved something as simple as recovering people coming into a group uh, in, uh, let's say, a school, for instance, and talking to students about the dangers of drug use. This was employed back in the 60s, even. I remember sitting in high school. It's part of my drunk log, huh? I remember sitting back in high school uh, and watching convicts that were there to talk to us and tell us how uh, rough prison was and all the bad things that could happen to us if we wound up there and how we had better avoid partying and smoking weed and things like that because we had wound up where they were. Of course, my buds and I were sitting on the back row going, yeah, well, you know, you guys were losers anyway. You don't understand. We're a lot cooler than that, which uh, turns out we weren't. <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, that's a universal approach. Uh, and you don't know who's in your group when you're doing a universal approach like that. Uh, if they were looking at uh, those of us who had already gotten in trouble, who had already been arrested for minor in possession, or who had been busted with uh, smoking at school, then it would have been more of a selective effort. Uh, but this was a universal one. And the universal efforts have not always been terrifically successful. We have had a lot of programs over the years, the Chicken Clubs, the D.A.R.E. program, the Just Say No, uh, you know, you name it, uh, that uh, have been employed to try to intervene at, uh, you know, the junior high school and high school levels. And some of them have been honestly worse than useless. Uh, and. Uh, uh, people who participated in the D.A.R.E. program have a slightly higher uh, uh, risk factor for using drugs than those, than those who didn't. We have uh, uh, a number of efforts uh, that have been done uh, over the years uh, that have focused from one, on one thing or on another thing. Uh, for instance, demand reduction versus supply reduction. This is something that usually occurs at the policy level. Uh, and demand reduction is uh, really, a, this is an economic model. Uh, and we have discovered, and we talked about that in the last chapter a little bit, 
that if you interdict on a drug, sometimes, uh, you know, on a, on a drug supply, then you either get a diversion of the drug supply or individual users or users in mass will turn to another source. If you cut off all of the drugs by an enforcement effort uh, to reduce marijuana being grown or distributed in the state, uh, people will uh, respond to that reduction. Uh, that's a supply side, uh, a supply side reduction. The demand has not been addressed. The demand for a substance is still there. So the demand creates a shift to another product, another drug, if you, uh, if you will. Uh, so if you reduce the demand by, uh, if you reduce the uh, supply, then the demand is not uh, affected. If you reduce the demand, the supply is affected. If people are not wanting the drug, are not buying the drug, or using less, etc. Uh, the example the book uses is if no one wants to buy a widget, then the factory makes fewer widgets. There are fewer widgets being out there. And the widgets get cheaper, too, because there are price wars to, uh, to that. Demand reduction uh, is uh, uh, interdictions that uh, are directed towards the users, towards the consumers, so that they don't want the substance, or somehow you make the substance unattractive toward them, uh, for them. Uh, supply side is hammering uh, the people who supply the substances. That's, you know, law enforcement, uh, you know, breaking up meth labs, etc. Uh, so to uh, create a drought of substances, if you will. Uh, prohibition, uh, back in the 20s, did both. Uh, they jailed people for using illegal alcohol, for possessing illegal alcohol. They jailed people for manufacturing and distributing uh, uh, legal alcohol. Uh, all of that uh, was uh, supposedly to uh, uh, among uh, was supposedly to limit the supplies of things that got out. The government went so far as to put in poison in some alcohol so that if uh, it was used to make whiskey with, then people who consumed it would uh, die. Uh, so most of the uh, focus of prohibition was supply side. There wasn't a big uh, push on the demand side. There were some things, I mean, on, on the demand side, yes, uh, there were some efforts. Women's Christian Temperance Union, etc., uh, were uh, trying to uh, reform individual drinkers out there to keep them from using. Uh, what are we trying uh, uh, to prevent? Uh, is something that has to be taken into consideration when you're discussing uh, prevention and how are we going about preventing it and how do we know that we're being successful uh, when, we, uh, when we do this. Those are questions that any uh, prevention program has to take into consideration and any substance abuse counselor or any treatment professional who's involved in that have to consider what their role is and how they can best fulfill their role, uh, uh, the role that they're called upon to do. Generally speaking, just going out and telling your story to a group of uh, high school students isn't going to cut it. So, uh, a good idea is to get involved with, uh, and, and a good idea also is to have some prevention people, some education services with the agency that you work with, and you may be called upon uh, to be a part of that at some point. <sighs> Here's Dare. Uh, 
CSAP efforts to disseminate research-based programs. This is something else you'll hear a lot of uh, in, uh, in, the, in prevention, and you will probably have an opportunity to be involved in some prevention efforts uh, as part of your education here at Lee College. I know I certainly encourage uh, students to attend uh, meetings with Southeast Coalition and get involved in that. And we have six hours of training as well as a cooperative education in prevention services here at Lee College. Uh, and that pretty well preps you uh, to be able to uh, get a uh, uh, certified prevention specialist uh, credential when you, uh, when you leave here as well as your uh, CI and eventually your LCDC. The, um, uh, and if you do, uh, it, you'll hear a lot of talk about uh, uh, evidence-based strategies, uh, environmental strategies. You'll hear about uh, uh, social norming, etc. And these are specific efforts to change things environmentally uh, in the neighborhoods where uh, substance use may take place and to change it in a, uh, uh, in a specific way that reduces risk for people in the neighborhood, particularly teenagers. Uh, the focus of um, some efforts uh, are and this is with treatment and prevention, really. Uh, there's discussion around whether a person's goal for a client or a, whether a person's goal in prevention should be for absolute abstinence, for not using anything at all ever, or should it be for harm reduction? Uh, if we reduce the level of consumption, say, for teenagers who uh, are um, uh, drinking alcohol on the weekend, uh, have we done a good thing? Maybe. And how do we measure that? Uh, back in the 80s, I was involved with creating a program in Deer Park for the neighborhood there. Uh, that was a minor in possession program, uh, me and Kevin Thompson and some other people. Uh, so, and that's what we did. And we had uh, Judge Tom Ritchie, who was uh, uh, referring people to our program there in Deer Park. And we even got, you know, written up in the local newspaper that we were doing, you know, good stuff. Uh, because Center Street in Deer Park was a place where teenagers would cruise on the weekend and smoke weed and drink beer in every little town in America, and the big ones too, have a street where the teenagers like to go and hang out. I mean, that was true then, and that's true now. Uh, and um, so uh, they were getting busted, and instead of uh, putting them in jail for a period of time or charging them big fines, they would refer these kids to us. And so uh, we got a record for doing a real good job because we give them an alternative to that. And that alternative was to participate in the minor and possession groups that we had uh, where they agreed not to use uh, for the time that they were participating in there and they would come to meetings twice a week uh, and if they finished uh, uh, 90 days of that, finished uh, the meetings, then when it was like being on probation, uh, then we wrote a letter, said they did what they were supposed to, and Tom should cut them loose. Uh, and so we, you know, it was great. We got, uh, you know, the, we reduced all of this drinking and drugging that was happening on Center Street. Uh, and we did. I mean, that did happen, which, yeah, yes, huh? Except that the people who were cruising Center Street and getting high were now cruising Sylvan Beach down in La Porte and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, down into Seabrook and Pasadena and places like that. They, it wasn't that their behavior had changed. It was just where they were engaging in their behavior. 
uh, had changed. And so, uh, you know, again, doing the things that we know works is one thing, but knowing that they work is another. And, you know, being able to define what we've changed and how we've changed it. Uh, so, it, uh, it matters. Evidence-based strategies is taking the things that we've done before and which have worked and taking the things that other people have done and which works and replicating. And we replicate it because it's been proven as an evidence-based strategy to be uh, effective. There are a number of things that we're not so sure about when it comes to modeling programs. Uh, you know, uh, there's a cartoon right here that uh, says, why aren't prevention programs more successful? Uh, says the little old lady. Uh, and the counselor person answers, because getting drunk is still fun. Uh, and that's a simplistic <laughs> explanation, uh, but probably a true one. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, is, is, is never ending. There is no end to the, uh, to the issue, although there are ends to the funding cycles. And I've been uh, involved in, uh, uh, you know, in this, in treatment and educa treatment education and uh, all of that since uh, the mid 80s. And one thing that I've noticed is that uh, there's uh, sometimes a constant reinvention of the wheel. And at one point, an agency I worked for was putting addiction counselors in school, and we would identify kids who were having problems, and they would self-identify and come to us, and we had counselors there. And uh, the uh, uh, incidences of drug use and things like that that were being reported every semester would uh, drop, and we had groups where kids would participate, et cetera, and so forth. And, things would get better and uh, when things got better the funding would get cut and they'd, they'd say thank you very much hasta la vista glad for uh, happy you solved the problem for us and away we go uh, and uh, the problem was never solved uh, the um, prevention efforts you don't finally reach a saturation point so sustainability then becomes an issue of how do you keep your uh, prevention efforts going. And if you're gearing your prevention efforts, say, to 15-year-olds, that's all you're doing, just 15-year-olds, uh, then when do you get finished? Because every year there's a new batch of 15-year-olds, and every year that population changes because last year's 15-year-olds or this year's 16-year-olds. Get my draft? Uh, a lot of job security if you got the funding there. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, that there were studies done that described environmental strateg strategies that were undertaken in prevention efforts. Uh, and uh, the environmental strategies are designed to affect the physical and social environments, which produce uh, which promote alcohol and drug use. And, and environmental strategies include uh, cleaning up graffiti, you know, uh, uh, implementing and supporting tobacco-free school districts, uh, encouraging community policing, party dispersals, workplace programs, health professional training, uh, code enforcements, diversion programs. Uh, the MIP was a diversion program doing something other than a uh, legal thing. And sanctions for drinking and driving. Uh, and that's about changing the environment in which uh, people walk about on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're bombarded with the opportunities to use and uh, with the signals telling us not only this okay to use, but actually encouraging us to. Uh, then there's individual strategies uh, that are about uh, st 
strengthening individuals to resist, and these include parenting classes, youth mentoring, youth job referrals, programs for the elderly, uh, anti-gang efforts, uh, uh, youth self-esteem, conflict resolution, refusal skills, all of that good stuff. Uh, and um, uh, then finally, the third approach is supply, cost, and availability strategies. And again, these are uh, uh, closing crack houses, opposing or closing liquor outlets in high-risk areas, banning liquor sales on Sunday, uh, demolishing abandoned buildings, that kind of thing. Prevent uh, supply side uh, supply side stuff to keep the uh, to to limit the opportunities for people to get and use drugs. If you're going to do a prevention effort, and you'll learn those in the prevention classes, is one of the things you have to do is a needs assessment. See what's going on in a particular neighborhood. What's going on with the individuals in it? What kind of problems that they're having? What kind of resources are available to you? Who can you count on to participate, etc., and so forth? A central dilemma that faces community-based prevention efforts is that they uh, are disproportionately directed at a single element. Uh, and that single element may carry the least weight, uh, you know, and that is the individual psychological makeup and functioning. Uh, if we uh, uh, are doing that, then uh, uh, one writer borrowing from the field of environmental pollution compares this approach to downstream efforts in tackling pollution. Uh, and this is, you know, trying to clean up the stuff that washes out, uh, you know, at the, at the outlet of the river rather than addressing, you know, where it's entering the river, doing an upstream uh, approach. Uh, anyone who is involved in prevention efforts needs to think critically, uh, long and hard, about how to apply any program to a particular situation that's faced. In areas of social change and social change models, you'll learn this when you brush up against sociology classes, social psychology classes, so social work classes, and, uh, and addiction counseling classes too, a little bit. Uh, is uh, uh, the uh, impact of, uh, you know, society and of certain events that happen in society. Anytime there's been a major upheaval or a major change, uh, prohibition for instance, the reason that prohibition came about is that a group of people recognize a problem and that problem was alcoholism in society. And they came at it from different perspectives. Uh, but everyone agreed it was a problem, and they got together and they defined the problem. They knew what it was they wanted to address, they knew what it was they wanted to accomplish, and they set about accomplishing it. They defined the problem, uh, they recognized uh, uh, people that they could get on their side, they agitated. Uh, for the problem, and eventually they got big enough and strong enough that they actually brought about a constitutional amendment, the 18th Amendment, that banned alcohol in the United States. Uh, it didn't work out. I mean, 13 years, you know, we uh, uh, used a, uh, a legal uh, sanctions model to stop people from drinking, and it uh, and it didn't it didn't stop people from drinking, though it did slightly reduce incidences of, uh, of alcoholism. Um, the uh, uh, truth of the matter is that we can't do everything, uh, so we need to consider what we can do and what uh, and what uh, will work. What are the most pressing concerns? Uh, some of the more pressing concerns that we uh, have seen in the United States and the way they've been addressed, and again, this is something that uh, is just uh, we've talked about before as a review, uh, mothers against drunk driving. Uh, that's their focus. Uh, you know, 
Does it involve doing things to help keep teenagers from starting drinking in the first place? Yes, a little bit. Uh, does it uh, uh, help uh, keep them off of the road? Yes, it does. And the focus of, um, of the Mothers Against Drunk Driving is just that, to prevent drunk driving, anything that they can do. Uh, to uh, prevent people from getting behind the wheel intoxicated. The Mothers Against Drunk Driving are uh, the reasons that we have uh, more stringent uh, DWI laws all across the country. It was this group agitating for social change that are most responsible for it. Uh, historically, the substance abuse fail has de de developed outside of mainstream medicine and the other helping professions. Uh, we are not, per se, law enforcement people, or uh, uh, we are not necessarily, uh, you know, prohibitionists. We are not necessarily uh, religious. We are not necessarily a lot of things. Uh, we aren't doctors for the most part, uh, or even nurses for the most part, although some of us are. Uh, the uh, uh, alcohol uh, treatment profession drew out of the recovery, grew out of the recovery experience of um, AI for the, for the most part. Um, uh, this, by the way, is uh, the European model uh, stats that's mentioned in your book. I won't uh, go over those as prevention, but you can see for yourself there's uh, uh, the data and the uh, meaning of the data, what, what that boils down to. Uh, but uh, the, the substance abuse field in Texas, once upon a time, uh, all you had to do to be a substance abuse counselor was write substance abuse counselor on a piece of, you know, uh, construction paper and tape it to your window. Uh, and things have changed about that um, uh, in that nowadays. It's no longer necessarily staffed by paraprofessionals and is no longer functioning in isolation. Uh, separate and outside the health and human service mainstream. Uh, we are usually involved in treatment teams. We don't, uh, you know, we're not all employed at, uh, you know, uh, three room houses that have been converted into halfway houses, you know. Uh, so the, the business is more professional uh, for us uh, nowadays. Uh, so, um, the, uh, anyway, uh, we have traditionally dealt with a population that most people don't want to deal with, uh, other professionals don't want to deal with, and we grew out of a necessity. And we grew out of the philosophy that the therapeutic value of one drunk helping another drunk, a, a philosophy, uh, is unparalleled. Uh, and there is truth to that. Uh, you know, the AA experience has been a tremendous experience. It, AA saved my life. That's my little drunk along there. Uh, but uh, the uh, truth, of the truth of the matter is. Uh, it would be probably unethical for me to just 12, sell the 12 steps to someone who can walk down the street and get it for free, wouldn't you agree? So, uh, as, a, uh, a, as a professional, then my approach to treatment should be somewhat different than the non-professional self-help person should be. I'm not disparaging anyone. But if all I have to offer you is my own experience uh, in recovery, then I'm not going to be able to help a whole hell of a lot of people because it's going to be a narrow focus of people who are like me or who relate to me. 
Uh, and truth of the matter is, we see a lot of different kinds of clients who come through with specific and unique problems that I haven't experienced my, myself. And uh, they haven't experienced mine, so I have to be uh, uh, judicial. The people who we see a lot of sometimes are people who have had, uh, who were treatment failures. Uh, there was uh, uh, a problem sometimes with burnout with inpatient uh, counselors is that uh, they get a distorted view of the effectiveness of alcohol treatment. We get someone in for 30 days, we give it our best shot in the time we have with them and the individual counseling and the group counseling. And it comes time for them to discharge. They're 30 days sober. We give them a list of meetings and some phone numbers and tell them, here's where you go to find yourself a sponsor and uh, good luck to you. Uh, and we send them on their way. Uh, and then we don't see them again. Or when we do see them again, it's because they're relapsed and they're back in treatment again. And if the only time you see your clients co uh, coming back to you is when, uh, when they're relapsed again, you're starting from scratch, it can be very discouraging. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, is what I'm doing working? Is it worth anything? I know I've shared this uh, with you before, but I'll share it with you again. Uh, that early on in uh, my recovery, I was involved with Palmer Drug Abuse Program, and I saw a lot of youngsters coming in there. And I have to admit, I was a bit haughty and arrogant with them, and I looked down on them a little bit. I was like, oh, dude, you got caught with a joint at school. Who are you? Uh, and come back and see me when you get a drug problem. Uh, but, you know, these were people who were kind of dragged in by their ear, by their parents. And I'm thinking, well, you know, they don't want to be here. They came in as a group. They hung out together. They're all youngsters. And uh, um, then they would leave as a group and relapse and stay gone. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, this is, you know, this, this whole thing is kind of ridiculous. Uh, but what I discovered later on in this was that uh, the people who had come in and been uh, early success and then a, a failure in their, in their sobriety, who got sobered a little bit and then uh, relapsed and went back out to using, what I discovered was that they started showing up in 12-step meetings and things later on uh, when they were in their 20s. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they knew there was a place to go and they knew that there was a solution to their problems and they knew there was something they could do about it and they did something about it. Uh, and they were saved sometimes years of uh, what other people had to go through in order to get to their bottom, uh, if you will, uh, and make a, make a turnaround. Anyway, uh, sharing expertise with colleagues is an important thing. Uh, supporting colleagues, supporting people who are uh, in the uh, uh, field, who work alongside you and with you. Uh, make yourself available to other professionals for consultation. Help uh, other professionals who might be getting discouraged and having uh, burnout is another uh, ancillary thing that uh, may not be part of your job description but is actually part of your uh, obligation to the profession and to, uh, to your fellows. Being a professional also means being a part of, uh, being a, a part of change and having open minds. I don't teach this class the same way I taught it when I first came to work at Lee College because that was uh, several decades ago. And there's been a whole lot of changes, a whole bunch of discoveries, a whole bunch of new ways of looking at things and doing things that are more effective. Uh, and, you know, I read uh, uh, from a philosopher 
uh, one time uh, that it's the, uh, the learner who is prepared for a changing world while the learned are perfectly suited to living in the past. Uh, and there's a great, that was uh, Eric Hoffer, by the way, uh, but there, uh, there are certainly a lot of people who are in that, uh, in that um, state. What we sometimes consider as being in a groove actually turns out to being in a rut. Uh, and sometimes we don't really recognize that ourselves. Uh, so uh, there are a bunch of things that people resist. And, and I'm speaking again as a sinner, not as a saint in that one. I had a tough time uh, when I was first asked to educate people on how to clean uh, syringes, you know, so that they wouldn't uh, pass on infectious uh, blood-borne pathogens such as HIV to one another, uh, and how to wear condoms and use, uh, you know, nonoxanol 9 and other spermicides and things like that. To, uh, and I'm saying, well, wait a minute, this, you know, isn't really what I signed up to do, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, I'm uncomfortable with it. And uh, what I discovered was that, um, you know, I, it did not compromise me morally. It did not compromise me in terms of my own, um, uh, allegiance to my sobriety, or, or it didn't make me uh, a, a sinner in my own eyes. The truth of the matter was that it was, again, a very practical thing uh, that was a way for me as a substance abuse counselor who are working with high-risk people and all of my clients were high risk. All of your clients are high risk in terms of, uh, uh, you know, infectious disease in that regard. Uh, and I'm already working with them, and they we already have a relationship. And uh, you know, this is something that uh, puts me in a perfect position to do this. So um, I did. Uh, and I, I made that step and I incorporated that and, uh, and, and I don't re regret any of it, of course, uh, of uh, working with people who really don't want to stop using, who want to cut down, who want to do uh, uh, harm reduction methods. I, there's still conflict there. Uh, I think that controlled drinking programs, per se, are largely unsuccessful. They still are. Uh, there's no data uh, to indicate that people who um, are uh, that people who have a chemical dependency uh, are any better at controlling it now than they ever were. <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, you know if you're sober. Uh, and you've uh, established abstinence, you, could, you should probably roll with that instead of fooling around trying to uh, uh, figure out a way that you can uh, uh, still drink. But harm reduction works for some people, and I recognize uh, uh, that too. Uh, so, again, part of my uh, approach to counseling and part of your approach to counseling uh, should be, you know, that uh, uh, there really is different strokes for different folks. And this begins with uh, a, a thorough evaluation of what's going on uh, with an individual and gearing treatment uh, towards uh, what we think they need and what they, and what they think they want uh, as much as we can. Now, uh, you know, honesty is another big part of this. I tell people, you know, that uh, I used to use abstinence contracts with people. There would be folks who tell me I can quit anytime I want to, you know. And I'd say, well, if you can control it, why don't we do an abstinence contract? And this was back in the 80s, and the abstinence contracts are kind of passe today. Uh, but. Uh, uh, if you sign a contract with me saying that, uh, uh, you know, you're going to stay sober for 30 days, uh, you know, and prove that uh, you don't have a problem or whatever the time limit we said is, 
Uh, this means there are no exceptions. You can't uh, break the contract because you had a hard day at work. You can't break the contract because your birthday fell within that 30 days. You can't break the contract because you went to a wedding and you needed to toast the bride. You can't break that contract. Uh, and if you do, then you're admitting to me and to uh, uh, yourself and to, uh, the people that you love that you really aren't in control of your drinking and need uh, something, uh, you know, something more in the way of treatment. And uh, I, I was, I would tell people, and I would talk to them in front of their uh, wife or husband, that uh, or parents or whomever. Uh, that, uh, you know, this isn't a contract that I can take you into court and sue you for breach of contract. Uh, but if you're serious about this uh, and you sign this contract in good faith that you're going to stay sober for 30 days and you can't do it, something's wrong. Something is definitely wrong. So, uh, um, most of the people that I saw that were chemically dependent, and of course they couldn't stay sober 30 days. Now, some of them did, and if they did, my hat's off to them. I have, had, I have seen some people who weren't chemically dependent, you know, but uh, uh, so anyway, uh, be flexible. If new skills come down, uh, come down the pipe, new data comes up, uh, uh, medical assisted treatment is a big deal nowadays. People who are using uh, medication to, uh, to enhance sobriety, uh, to, uh, to, to block opiate receptors, to prevent cravings, to, uh, to control consumption of alcohol with abuse to make people sick when they drink it. Uh, there's um, there's a lot of things that are out there that are more than, uh, you know, uh, read the big book, go to meetings, and call your sponsor. Mm. Knowledge dissemination uh, is a big thing, too. Uh, SAMHSA, NIDA, uh, there are a lot of agencies out there, uh, uh, federal resources, state resources, etc., that... Uh, churns out an incredible amount of information about uh, about treatment trends, what's going on, how we're doing with reducing, uh, what are, uh, you know, uh, uh, incidences of substance use in the country, et cetera, and so forth. You can find out about different demographics of people, uh, what's working best with this group, what's working best with that group, uh, and you should manage uh, to keep yourself abreast as much as you can of current trends in the field. Uh, it's important to do that. You don't want to be left behind. So, Chaucer said uh, about uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, travelers to Canterbury, the, 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 the student, that gladly did he learn uh, and gladly teach uh, And that's the truth, you know. The things that you learn are not yours to withhold and to keep inside, but information flows through us, you know. Uh, and the things that we learn uh, when we go to conferences, when we take specific trainings, when we do that kind of thing, it comes through us, uh, and we pass it on in our classrooms, in our group rooms, in our presentations, in the papers that we write, in the things that we do. Uh, so, uh, it says here that uh, uh, what is significant is that following education and training for individuals, that there's sometimes no differences in attitudes based on recovery status. It doesn't matter if you're a recovering person or an unrecovering person in the field. Although potentially more conservative in adapting new approaches and less likely to jump on the bandwagon of the most recent approach, those in recovery are no more close to new approaches 
when provided with information and an opportunity to gain new skills. Interesting, huh? A big area of concern uh, is here. Now, this is data that's a few years old because I think this, you know, was about six or seven years ago when this edition came out. Uh, maybe not that long. Uh, but computer literacy at the time is that the average age of those in the substance abuse workforce, and that's taking us all together and, you know, averaging it, is 52 years old. Uh, and those of us in that age group often uh, are folks who are not real great with computers. Uh, I never uh, turned a computer on, uh, you know, until I was around 40 years old, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and uh, of course the, the, the kids, uh, and a lot of you in my class, you know, uh, the computer's about as mysterious to you as a refrigerator or something you've been using your whole life, you know? Uh, so um, there's, uh, there's a lot that we do with computers nowadays, and there's a lot being done with computers right now because of the COVID pandemic that we're all uh, have been, um, you know, shut down with. I'm still working from home. Uh, so being somewhat or at least minimally proficient with computers and electronic, uh, you know, uh, communication simply isn't good enough. You and I uh, and, uh, you know, everyone in this field needs to get good at it. Uh, we need to be able to use, uh, you know, programs. And I'm speaking again as a center. I mean, I just really uh, get frustrated sometimes doing doing computer work, but, uh, you know, got to bite the bullet, get in there and do what you have to do. Uh, uh, interdisciplinary contacts, um, sometimes you do have to do interdisciplinary stuff. Uh, and uh, one thing that uh, uh, we need to know is that uh, uh, you know, sometimes there's attitude that comes from one discipline to another. Uh, nurses cop attitudes to doctors. Doctors cop attitudes to nurses. Uh, English teachers cop attitudes to tech folk teachers. And tech folk teachers cop attitudes towards academics. Uh, we have to communicate. We have to support one another. We have interdisciplinary contacts. Uh, to we and uh, to quote Father Martin, we don't have attitudes; they have us, and they die about 15 minutes after we do. Uh, so, being able to detect attitude not in another person but in yourself is very important. And if you're going to take part in uh, you know any kind of education, and you need to not have uh, not discount other people, not uh, uh, come across as arrogant to other people, but to be able to cooperate and to learn uh, from one another is uh, important. So play nice is basically what that boils down to. Uh, when you go to work out there, and I've had some people come back and express their displeasure to me, uh, if you go to work in an office, if you go to work in a clinic, in a treatment program, at a freestanding hospital, in a probation department, dear hearts, there will be office politics. There's office politics at Lee College. There's office politics wherever you go. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are some bosses that are easier to work for than other bosses. There are some places where you go where the things that are expected of you align entirely with your uh, personal preferences and philosophies and things are wonderful and off you go and, you know, it's, it's groovy. Uh, and other times it's not. The workforce that, uh, of the people that we're entering into nationally is uh, predominantly white, predominantly female, and over age 45. 
uh, and that's the, basically the treatment uh, field. Uh, there are, um, let me back up here just a second, uh, that, uh, uh, so, anyway, retention uh, can be difficult. Uh, people um, in the helping professions enter them and leave them at approximately the same rate. Uh, so folks, uh, some, I, you know, I've been, uh, I was in the provision of treatment directly for some six years, I think, and then I became a teacher where I provided treatment uh, Early on in my teaching career, I hung with the uh, treatment provision. I did saw clients and uh, uh, did contract work for external agencies, etc. But uh, uh, then um, I kind of gravitated towards just teaching, and uh, I still do some things sometimes to keep my hand in. I serve on some boards, etc. But um, uh, the you know, I, I found a, a niche for myself in the classroom, and I like it. Uh, so that's kind of where I am. Uh, later on, I fell off into some administrative stuff with becoming division chair, etc., uh, which is okay too. I don't like it as much as teaching, but I like it. Uh, so uh, there are uh, issues in a changing career in advancement. Uh, potentially one of the most uh, uh, problematic uh, things here centers on leading the clinical area for administrative position uh, and being a good uh, clinician doesn't make you a good supervisor being a good supervisor doesn't make you a good clinician uh, there are two different skill sets in you know the first is uh, the consider is the obvious one the extent of your administrative uh, skills if you don't like supervising other people and you don't like paperwork and you don't like budgeting and all of that kind of good stuff this probably is not the move for you uh, you know uh, on one hand on the other hand maybe you will like it if you learn how to do it uh, so you know they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks uh, and the and that's not true. You can certainly teach an old dog new tricks. You just have to be cognizant that he's an old dog and, you know, uh, adjust your training to that, uh, to that degree. Uh, uh, again, a Father Martin quote, if you're too old to learn, you're just too damn old. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can learn to fit into uh, uh, a management role and skills if that's what you want. If it's not what you want, there's no shame in uh, taking another path. I might uh, add this caveat here too. I have had over the years several students come back to me, and you know I've seen them in other uh, uh, roles other than a substance abuse counseling uh, as counselor. I ran into one of my students. Uh, and uh, uh, working for Kinds, a department store, and I think she was doing cameras or something there, had the, that department. And I said, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I said, you, you spent those years in school and, you know, got your degree and went out to be a counselor and set the world on fire. Why are you here? And uh, she said, can I be honest with you? And I said, I wish you would. And she said, I hate working with drug addicts. And uh, that's a very good reason not to be in the field as a substance abuse counselor. And uh, I appreciated that honesty. I appreciate that honesty that she had with herself more than anything else, that this was not something uh, that she enjoyed or wanted to pursue. Some of my students wound up working in, uh, uh, in school. Some of them wound up working in treatment centers. Some of them wound up working in uh, law enforcement and probation offices. And uh, uh, some of them went on and got other degrees and worked as marriage uh, counselors, family counselors, uh, 
uh, had a couple of psychologists came out of the deal. Uh, uh, a young man who was specialized in deaf education, etc. Uh, I also had a few of them go into private practice, and a couple of them all opened their own uh, halfway houses slash treatment centers. Uh, and this is a, a, a mighty bold step for someone to do, you know, who's coming out of a, a, a two-year program with an LCDC and get going into private practice because that uh, uh, requires a lot of skills. And some of these skills you don't get with us because of the uh, focus of the program. And again, those are the management skills that I'm talking about. If you do go into private practice, if you do decide to open your own program, you need to have an advisory board or a clinical director, uh, uh, someone that you can go to and talk to and do consultations with uh, so that you can make sure that you're keeping everything uh, in focus so that you're doing the best thing uh, for your clients and also keeping your business afloat. So. Uh, private practice is not the place for a newcomer or someone who hasn't, you know, you need to have been around a while to see how things work. Uh, being a professional, uh, and the professional counselor has mastered a body of knowledge and has special kill, skills, but they also have a code of ethics uh, to, uh, uh, to guide them. You can't... Um, you know, uh, the whole idea that uh, substance abuse counselors are, uh, are rough and tough and can't be fooled and don't take no crap and will be in your face and shout you down and uh, confront you to death if you uh, uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, avoid responsibility for yourself is uh, a stereotype. And it's a bad stereotype. If, uh, uh, if the best tool that you have in your toolbox is confrontation, it basically means you don't have enough tools. So uh, you need to, uh, need to uh, learn professional uh, conduct. We have different levels of training. It's kind of tough to... Uh, you know, to work with people in the time that we have to work with them in a two-year degree program to uh, uh, give them the same level of skills that they might get, you know, in a uh, six-year uh, program uh, going through, you know, bachelor's in behavioral uh, health or, or uh, yeah, and, behavioral science and then into a master's program. Uh, so we give you as best as we can, but uh, you know, you're not functioning at the same level as a, as a, as a master's level uh, counselor or as a PhD. Uh, so it's incumbent upon you uh, as you go along to uh, uh, look at areas where you're deficient and try to uh, find resources to develop your skills as you uh, go along and to become more sophisticated in the practice uh, of those skills and not be offended uh, if uh, or um, Embarrassed if you uh, you know are lacking in some of them, but address the needs uh, that you have. It can be stressful to be a counselor. Uh, a lot of people uh, need your help. A lot of people will ask for your help. Uh, sometimes the people that you work for will throw folks your way without regard to your health and your well-being, your frustration levels, or your time, or your energy levels. So the next thing you know, uh, you've got way too many clients, and that, that's a, a, a burnout risk. Uh, spreading yourself too thin is a problem, and it's a danger. It's a danger to you, and it's a danger to your clients. Um, 
So, uh, you know, you have to set boundaries and you have to be sure that you take care of yourself because if you don't, then uh, how are you going to help someone else? The, uh, we can't always, uh, you know, make a determination about how many people we see. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, the job requires that we see more than we're comfortable with. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of tough to set boundaries with a boss who decides whether you're going to, you know, be employed there or not. Uh, you can't take total responsibility for the clients and you can't take uh, personal responsibility totally for the workload, although you should have some input uh, into, your, into your workload. Uh, and there are some things that you can do to help yourself. Uh, try to get a little time between sessions. Review a chart before you see your next patient. Because if you're seeing a bunch of uh, people, bam, 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 uh, you see seven or eight people in a work day, five days a week, they start running together. And they will run together for you. That's a guarantee. Uh, and you want to make sure that you're talking to the right person. And that you're, so t if you, you know, take time. Make sure that you schedule these sessions where you can, uh, you know, review the notes from the last time you saw this client or whatever. Um, some of you may wind up where uh, almost everything that you're doing is intakes, uh, and you you won't have that problem. You'll have a different set of problems, which is, you know, making sure that you use the right screening instruments and uh, uh, get your notes and conclusions in, etc. and so forth. Uh, so, uh, if you find yourself celebrating too much and doing your happy dance because a client just canceled their two o'clock appointment, uh, you may be uh, burned out. <laughs> anyway, uh, certification and licensure. Uh, we've already talked about that. I'll hit a few things. If you plan to work as a substance abuse counselor in Texas, you need at the very minimum uh, a certification as a counselor intern. And you get that when you finish at least 270 actual clock hours with your button chair um, of, of training in substance abuse specific or related courses. You do a 300 hour on the job training, which is your cooperative education. You get a letter from me, you apply to the state, and you get a counselor uh, intern certification. That means you can go to work in the field. Uh, and it's not volunteer, you get paid for this, and uh, uh, you have to do two years working as a, a CI. You can take your test uh, anywhere along in there uh, get to uh, uh, pass your, comp uh, your uh, uh, competency-based exam, uh, and then at the end of two years, you become a full-blown LCDC. Yay! Uh, and you have to have a license to pursue uh, your career beyond that. Now, if you have another type of license, whether it be, uh, I mean, another type of degree, whether it be a PhD uh, or you have another credential uh, such as an LPC or MSW or something along those lines, you can also get a substance abuse specialization certification too. Uh, and there are different requirements for that. There are uh, specialty certifications that you can get through uh, NADAC, which is the National Association of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Counselors, etc. And when you get your uh, license, when you get your LCDC, you will automatically become a member of NADAC and TADAC, uh, or TAP, rather, you, uh, TADAC, scratch TADAC. <laughs> TAP, Texas Association of Addiction uh, Professionals. So, um, and you can get certifications that way too. You can take specialty trainings and get other types of certifications, uh, which you should do if you want to work uh, in uh, specialty, uh, specialty fields. Uh, 
and uh, there's some data over here about uh, uh, what different states require or how that really uh, looks at, at, from state to state and national requirements. Uh, there's reciprocity among several of the states. Uh, Texas licensure uh, is, uh, requires a degree. Some other states don't require degrees. Some states require for, uh, uh, you know, just uh, a GED and a certain amount of training uh, or a high school diploma and a certain amount of training. Some states require master's degrees. Some require even more than that. Uh, so it depends on where you are. And the, in Texas, uh, we have uh, uh, reciprocity with a number of other states so that if you decide to leave here and go elsewhere, uh, then the transfer of credentials isn't, isn't a big deal. Uh, and this is, uh, another area where uh, national certifications may be helpful for you if you're going to be doing some traveling or looking uh, at something else. Uh, there uh, is uh, a little data on the substance abuse treatment workforce uh, and um, you can track some of it through uh, the uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, uh, which is the Labor Bureau, uh, and that's where I get most of my data when I want it, or through NIDA, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or through SAMHSA. Uh, so these are um, uh, places where they can serve as resources for you to pull data. Uh, again, some of the uh, people, uh, some of the people that uh, have LCDCs in Texas, they, uh, like me, they work as teachers in a, in a college somewhere. Uh, they may find themselves working in a, a counselor role or a teaching role in high school or junior high school. Uh, working as uh, prevention specialist, uh, running programs, uh, uh, providing counseling, frontline counseling at community uh, resources such as the Bay Area Council or uh, Houston Recovery Council, etc. Uh, they may wind up working for uh, prison systems, for Texas Department of Corrections, uh, or any of those places. And uh, uh, so you know, the, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, you can also go to work contracting. You can go to work for the military. You can, there's, you know, and you can go into private practice. Uh, the, uh, most people are making around $30,000 uh, if they go into uh, uh, entry level work, but that, uh, but that, uh, is uh, uh, is increasing, which is good, uh, and uh, you have benefits, and you uh, don't get rained out and stuff like that. In clinical care, the most basic tool you have to help others is yourself, and so so you have to think about the responsibility of working with others and how important that is. Uh, and uh, ethics is a field of study, is studying, you know, uh, uh, what's right, what's good, what you should be doing. Uh, and we have personal ethics or morality. We have mandatory ethics, which is uh, following rules. Uh, we have aspirational ethics, which is really engaging ourselves to look for the right and adhere to it. Uh, and we have professional ethics. And professional ethics are a shortcut way of identifying what the proper behavior is in most circumstances of a professional practice. Lawyers, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, uh, police officers, all of these people have standards of behavior uh, that are considered ethical standards and uh, that the public should be able to uh, 
apprehend what those standards are by the way that people behave themselves and to rely on what it is that uh, uh, that uh, uh, to rely on whatever that standard of behavior is from the people uh, that uh, practice that particular uh, profession. The uh, uh, the book uh, talks about several um, ethical principles, but there's a lot of ethical principles, loads of ethical principles, and we can't talk about all of them today. Uh, but uh, if you're a helper in a relationship, one of the things you have to believe in is the right to autonomy. And that means that your client has the right to choose the way they want to live. They have the right to choose, to make the ultimate decisions about their own lives. Uh, and we shouldn't take that away from them. Uh, clients have the ultimate right uh, to those decisions. The principle of beneficence. This means that whenever someone comes in and uh, sits down across from me, I put their best interest right at the front of that relationship. I only act in ways that promote good for them, and I do not act in ways uh, that would make them, uh, you know, that would uh, with an intent to harm them. It's not my job to make sure that someone pays for their crime. It's not my job to see that they get what's coming to them. It's not my job to decide the way that they are that they need to be and cause them to be that way. My job is to support them and to act with their best interest in mind. The third principle that the book mentions is the principle of justice. Uh, I'm being professional, but it also refers to the behavior that promotes social justice. It's a self-imposed obligation, uh, and to be fair, and to not discriminate, and to give everybody the best that I have, as much as I can. Uh, and uh, justice also means that I have to be kind of rough on myself. I have to look at my... Uh, uh, you know, my biases, my personal agendas, and things like that in a relationship with people. And I have to make sure that those are pure. Uh, there's plenty more non-maleficence to not act, uh, act in uh, uh, ways that would uh, uh, be harmful to my client, to not do anything intentionally to bring uh, injury. Uh, to them, loyalty to remain with them uh, once I commit to uh, the helping relationship to see it through, etc. But there are two ethical concerns that the book notes deserve special comment. Uh, one is confidential confidentiality and the others establish and maintaining boundaries between what's personal and professional. Uh, maintaining boundaries between my work and the rest of my life, etc. Confidentiality is not absolute. Uh, so anyone in the helping professions is uh, confidentiality is an issue, but I have to allow, uh, you know, I, I have to inform people right up front that this is not an absolute concept, that there are certain things that uh, uh, I will not keep confidential uh, in our relationship, uh, that there are limits to it, that if uh, I think you're going to harm yourself, if you're going to um, uh, do suicide or something to that effect, if you're going to do homicide, if you're going to injure someone else, if you're abusing an old person or a child, uh, I'm not going to keep that to myself. Those are things that are limits on confidentiality, or if you have done these things, those are limits on confidentiality. I discussed that with the clients. I also present it to them in writing and have them sign off that they understand it, and I'll enter in the notes that we talked about it. Uh, so, uh, and this is something that if you're supervising and uh, working with uh, other people, interns, students, uh, other counselors that you're supervising, 
you uh, need to make sure that they're up on that. Any place that you go to work uh, will have you sign off on uh, your um, on, on uh, uh, ethics ethical standards, or will expect you to abide by these ethical standards. Uh, there are also laws pertaining to confidentiality, and uh, you know you need to be advised of what those laws are, where you are. Federal laws and state laws, which, by the way, often don't uh, 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 support one another. <laughs> you know, the state may ask you to do something that the federal government says you can't, uh, and we see uh, some of that. There are uh, things that sometimes we don't think of that are ethical violations. If uh, after a meeting you and I go out to um, Denny's or somewhere, Starbucks, and sit down and we're having coffee and talking about what a stressful day we had and how this one client's driving us nuts, uh, and then we look around and and there's that client and his mother sitting in a booth behind us with uh, appalled expressions on their face. We violated confidentiality. If I leave a client in my office with someone else's file laying out, I violated confidentiality. If someone calls and asks to speak to so-and-so and I say, yeah, just a minute, I'll get them, I violated confidentiality. If someone asks me for information about a client and I give it to them, I violated confidentiality. So uh, we want to be careful uh, when we do that sort of thing to make sure that uh, you know that if we give any information at all about anyone, that we have prior consent uh, from the individual. Uh, regarding who we're going to release information to, what information is going to be released, and how long the permission is good for. Uh, and there are forms to do that. Almost every agency has them. I don't suspect that would be a problem for you to do that. Emailing and texting, that's a problem. Uh, if uh, someone uh, sends me a mail uh, email and says, Mr. Bushart, what's my grade in this class? And I email back, ah, well, you know, you're, you're doing pretty good, but not as good as I'd hope. You're passing by the skin of your teeth. Uh, uh, how do I know on the other end of that email is the person I'm supposed to be sending it to? Uh, now, I, I've got guidelines for that. Uh, you know, at the college to tell me, you know, what, what sh how I should handle those requests, what the situation should be. And usually I direct the client, uh, the student client, <laughs> uh, direct the student, you know, to, to Blackboard where they can figure their own grade. Uh, but um, I could be, uh, uh, you know, disclosing information to people who, um, have no business doing it. Same with uh, uh, with Facebook and things like that. I'm pretty sure that you're who you say you are, but I'm not absolutely sure, so I'm kind of vague. <laughs> People ask me questions in, in those capacities. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. The other is with... Uh, uh, with um, uh, setting boundaries is an ever important and ongoing dilemma is establishing uh, appropriate boundaries in relationship uh, and there can be challenges with that uh, you know in a big city uh, or in a, a large metropolitan area and I'm including Baytown in that you know uh, Baytown is big enough that uh, uh, you know, we might get clients, we probably will get clients that we don't know. Uh, uh, and certainly we can get clients that we're not related to. Uh, but the smaller the community, the more rural the community or smaller the community, that chance, uh, the, those things diminish. Uh, and dual relationship has always been a problem in the counseling profession. If I live in Willis, Texas, 
Well, I guess that's different now too. But when I did live in Willis, Texas, population around 1800, uh, chances were pretty good that uh, if I saw clients there, it'd be someone I knew, especially since I was also in the recovering community. So what do you do? You're, uh, uh, you're working with a client and that client shows up at your AA meetings, your NA meetings, the places you go for support. Uh, how do you handle that? How do you handle taking care of your own needs at your own support group meeting when there are clients in there? You've had a hard day at work and the client you're most pissed off at or most frustrated by or most attracted to or whatever the hell it is, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you, you wanted to talk to someone about that, but you can't. Uh, because a um, 12-step meeting is not the proper place to do that. It's definitely not the proper place if the person that you want to talk about is in there. What if you see a client at an AA dance and they say, will you dance with me? Uh, what if after the dance uh, uh, everyone's going to have coffee and cake and they say, will you go with me? Uh, what if after the coffee and cake, they said, uh, uh, I need to go home. You want to drop by and have coffee with me? Uh, what do you do? Where do you set the boundaries? Uh, well, we are the ones responsible for setting the boundaries. It's not the client. Uh, and so there, uh, you know, it's upon us to set the appropriate boundaries to keep my professional life and my private life uh, separate. Don't counsel your friends. Don't counsel your uh, uh, neighbors. Don't experiment on your kids. <laughs> you know? uh, and it's hard to uh, hard to work with uh, with uh, uh, relatives anyway. I've dragged some of my poor brothers to AA meeting after NA meeting, and uh, you know and uh, preached the gospel of recovery to them and uh, uh, had it rejected and all that good stuff. Uh, so, um, you know, we have different relationships and separating them is a good idea. Ethical uh, 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 issues that arise in alcohol and drug counseling are many and varied. Uh, one of the scariest that I had that freaked me out the most was uh, I uh, came home from work one day when I was still working in Deer Park uh, and uh, whipped through Burger King to get a nutritious dinner and went back to my apartment and kicked my uh, feet up, cut on the TV, uh, and there was one of my client's mothers on television with Marvin Zendler, the investigative reporter who was the consumer protection guy in Houston forever. Uh, and she was telling me how she'd taken her poor son to all of these different people uh, and none of them was able to uh, help her. None of them would do it. And, uh, you know, her son was out of control or yada, yada, yada. And part of that I agreed with. Her son was out of control. I had personally arranged for him to go into three different hospitals uh, and it didn't work out. Uh, I'm not blaming him. I mean, he was, you know, a, a totally messed up 17 year old. He was doing so many drugs, it's a wonder his head didn't explode. But he was also doing other things like strong arm robbery, smacking people over the head with a pipe and robbing them. Uh, uh, sexual assault with his girlfriend who tried to leave him, that kind of thing. Uh, and anyway, I like to choke on my fries. I immediately called uh, the uh, my medical supervisor, the psychiatrist I worked for, uh, not to mention any names, his initials were Dr. Jason Barron. And I said, uh, uh, yeah, holy cow, what am I going to do? He said, well, you know, uh, call them and uh, call the people and tell them we'll put them in the hospital for free. And uh, I said, well, you know, at the end of the uh, segment, uh, Marvin Zimmer, uh got another doctor, uh, and it was a competitor doctor, uh, to let him into the hospital for free. And he said, whew. 
but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, uh, pacified by that. I didn't feel good about that. That did not settle my nerve so that for a couple of weeks, you know, I would drive into the office taking different routes and I would drive past it and look around to see if there was any uh, Channel 13 vans hidden there anywhere uh, or anywhere in the area uh, and park my car in a parking lot that wasn't my parking lot. So if I did see a Channel 13 van, I could zip out the back and go somewhere else because I definitely did not want to be uh, cornered by a reporter who would stick a microphone in my face and say, uh, is this what you did with this young man? And you know what I get to say? Yep, you're absolutely right. The only thing I can say to any question about any client by any reporter who sticks a microphone in my mug is no comment. No comment, no comment. Do you know what uh, most of America hears when they hear someone say no comment? You know how they interpret that? You're absolutely right. They interpret that as the same as saying, I'm guilty, I did it. <laughs> you know? So I wanted to avoid that. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, you know, walking on eggshells for a while. Uh, but uh, nothing ever came of it, and that was a happy thing. Uh, if Even if your client goes public with some kind of claims, you can't go out and give details. You can't, it, it, you know, you can't do that. Confidentiality uh, prevents you. A code of ethics is a happy thing because it helps give us a, a, a parameter within which to operate some guidelines. But ethical codes don't cover everything. They just don't. There are things that come up uh, that uh, isn't written down in the Code of Ethics. Now we have to do some ethical thinking. This is where clinical supervision comes in handy again. If you have to make a, a, a decision on a, on a situation that you haven't faced before, uh, and you don't have a clear idea of what you should do, consultation's a, a happy thing. You can talk with some of your colleagues and uh, your supervisors to see which is the uh, best uh, course of action for you to take. There are uh, uh, some issues in clinical practice that have received a lot of attention, and some of them we haven't uh, come up with yet. Uh, in a research setting. Uh, most of us aren't going to spend a lot of time in uh, research, but it does happen. And we're, and we're not, uh, you know, most of us are not going to be involved with uh, dealing with research subjects, but that happens too. So uh, if you're in a institution that does research or you're involved in a research project, there are guidelines uh, that you can access and there are IRBs in place and those are institutional review boards that look at what your project is, uh, evaluate the risk factors uh, to participants, uh, evaluate the methodology that you're coming up with to conduct this research and give you either the go-ahead or the kibosh. Uh, so uh, uh, those are uh, protections, guidelines. And finally, uh, with uh, both with uh, research and with individual counseling and with providing treatment, we come to the concept of uh, uh, informed consent. And informed consent means giving uh, a client every bit of information that you have that will inform them of what you're proposing to do with them, what the risks are involved, how much it will cost, the, the, the length of time of involvement, etc., and so forth. Uh, and they need to know all of it because they have to make an informed decision about whether they want to participate or not. Uh, 
sometimes it's tempting to not give them all the information because you want to kind of guide them, manipulate, into a certain uh, decision. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're giving them a half-truth, then what you're doing is telling them a whole lie. Uh, so people need to know. People need to know uh, before they choose. That's the basic thing. And informed consent is giving them all the information that they need to make a decision. Uh, then there uh, are ethical uh, situations in the field. Uh, and uh, for me, and this has changed a lot over the years, but one of the things that most appalled me about the field that I'm in uh, involved adolescence. Uh, and I've heard uh, all my life, I saw it on Facebook this morning, the problem in the world isn't, uh, uh, isn't authority, it's people who don't respect it. Uh, respect my authority uh, kind of stuff. You know, if authority really wants to be ex uh, respected, you know what it should be? It should be respectable. And I used to say adolescents get treatment uh, and mistreatment too in situations where uh, we demand respect from them but we don't give it to them in return. So if we want um, uh, people to uh, respect what we do, then what we do should be respectable. We should be able to articulate uh, what it is that we're doing in treatment. We should be open and above board with what we're doing in treatment. We should never manipulate data, uh, for instance, in ways that's uh, unethical, etc. And uh, we talk about that a lot more in another class. So anyway, um, some uh, uh, there's an example here on page 651 uh, about uh, uh, some ways that people uh, are sometimes manipulated uh, by either overstating data understating data or changing the language which basically makes the data that you're presenting ambiguous. It doesn't make sense to individuals. Uh, during the Reagan era, uh, NIDA, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, circulated a memo instructing librarians to destroy some of NIDA's own reports that had become outdated, misleading, and dangerous. In that same era, NIDA circulated a nomenclature uh, memorandum about uh, words that you should use and how you should label things. The, uh, there were unacceptable phrases that were to be avoided. Uh, illicit drug use, for instance. Uh, we wanted to get a, do away with that and change it to illicit drug abuse. Uh, the second uh, nomenclature, the change, illicit drug abuse, is less clear than illicit drug use. Uh, and it changes the way that people uh, uh, look at it. The, their reason was if it was illicit, then it had to be abuse. It couldn't be just, just use. Uh, the way we use language sometimes can be uh, misleading. Uh, in the mid-90s, the government was, um, uh, U.S. Department of State warned that uh, American agencies should avoid speaking positively about harm reduction because this was only code uh, for legalization. Uh, and the United Nations was also requested to clean up its language at that time. Uh, right after Bush was elected in 2004, the UN Office of Drug Control Policy was again requested to change its language. Uh, ensure references to harm reduction and needle syringe exchange are avoided in uh, UNODC uh, documents, publications, and statements. In 2004, 
Uh, NIDA sponsored research had reported that a single dose of ecstasy causes severe and profound uh, brain damage. Not true, by the way, uh, but uh, it takes, uh, once it's out there, it takes, uh, uh, you know, a hell of a long time to, uh, uh, to, to change that, and it's a lot of trouble. The uh, Howard Baker, uh, Becker, a sociologist, described these instances as politically inconvenient scientific knowledge. Uh, those, uh, there are people who work in federally funded agencies, for instance, who if you're counseling with a pregnant woman, if it's funded by a federal agency, you cannot uh, discuss abortion with them as an option uh, for the pregnancy. So there are demands on the uh, on the profession, uh, and the 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 greatest demand should be the demand that we put on ourselves, which is to uh, you know present the facts, just the facts, and only the facts as much as uh, as much as we can. Uh, I've already talked about uh, disease prevention, lecturing, etc. Some of you and me too, uh, are in recovery. Uh, in fact, today's April 20th. I'm 39 years sober today. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, 420, go figure, right? Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, many workers in the addiction field are in recovery. And, uh, you know, getting into the addiction field can be risky business for us because sometimes people who are in recovery get into the field and begin to rely on what we do as professionals uh, to take the place of a program that keeps us sober. In other words, we stop getting to doing the things that, uh, have, that have got us here and that uh, keeps us here, and that's a very bad idea. Uh, the um, uh, we have to maintain barriers between our private recovery and the things we do as professionals. We have to have good boundaries. Uh, if we relapse, that's a whole new set of problems for us because, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I haven't had a, a relapse as a counselor. I haven't, uh, you know, that hadn't been something that occurred for me, but I've seen them. And I, um, based on my record, I don't think I could maintain my job very well as a teacher, uh, certainly not as a counselor. If I were getting high, it would soon become obvious to everyone because that's the way I get high. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, what then? Uh, what if you do relapse or what if one of your colleagues relapsed? What should we do at that point? Well, we owe it to the field, and we owe it to our clients that if one of our colleagues has relapsed, we can't keep that to ourselves. You know, we can't allow the individual to, uh, to pretend like everything's okay and keep on working with clients. Uh, it's incumbent on us to talk to that individual or talk to a supervisor or whatever. And there are some resources for impaired professionals and things like that. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes if that happens, that means we lose our jobs. Uh, and so we've got a vested interest in, uh, you know, if we relapse and covering it up sometimes. Uh, this can be uh, disastrous uh, for all concerned. Uh, encourage reporting uh, by the individuals who are relapsed, uh, by, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, colleagues of individuals who relapse, whatever, uh, to get, not to come down on them punitively or to humiliate them or to weed out bad apples or anything like that, but to intervene in a positive way. And again, uh, and here's our uh, secondary uh, uh, interventions coming in, our preventions, identifying people who already have the disease and making every effort to, uh, uh, to reach them as early as possible and uh, 
our efforts should all be geared toward restoring them to good health. Doesn't always happen, but uh, that should be the goal. Uh, what else? I don't want to say anything else about that. Uh, and ta-da, look at that. Uh, we made it to the end of the lecture. Uh, and by golly, that means we made it pretty much to the end of the class itself. Um, I'm glad you hung with me this long uh, and stuck it out. I hope to uh, uh, see you next semester. I'd like to see some of you in person. I hope we get to go back in the classroom uh, at some point. But, uh, uh, you know, if not, see you here in the same format uh, in another class. Have a good, bright talk to you later.